Hi, I'm Christine Harding of the National Cryptologic Foundation, and welcome to our cyber chat. Um, today, we have the provost of the National Cryptologic School, Dr. Mark Asselin, who's going to talk to you about all the wonderful opportunities and courses in continuing education when you are employed with either the National Security Agency, U.S. Cyber Command, or the military. But for those of you that are thinking about cyber uh, to learn more, if you're in the middle, middle school or high school, or if you're in high school and deciding what you want to major in in, in college, the National Cryptologic School also manages 358 centers of academic excellence. And these are 358 universities that are across the U.S. I'm sure there's, there is one in every state, but these are centers that have cybersecurity majors and programs. So without further ado, I turn it over to Mark. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And good morning to everyone. I'm so pleased to have this opportunity to, to speak with you today. And I'm very grateful to the National Cryptologic Foundation for inviting us to speak. I'm here with my colleague, Mr. Matt Sprouse. We'll be doing a little demo in a little bit. Uh, but first, I want to tell you something about the National uh, Security Agency and the National Cryptologic School, which is the training arm of the NSA. But before we get started, I'd like to share with you a video that you can find on the NSA main webpage, external webpage, if you want to see it again later. Hear that? It doesn't sound like much, does it? But in the hands of an analyst at the National Security Agency, signals like these can become one of the most reliable and timely forms of intelligence available to America's leaders. Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT, is intelligence derived from signals. Signals contain information about our adversaries that is vital to our national security. They can help us determine where our adversaries are located, what they are planning, and what kind of weapons they are using. America relies on NSA to collect and process foreign signals, understand them, and share them with U.S. officials and warfighters so that they can take action to keep our nation secure. This is not an easy task. SIGINT is technically challenging to produce. It is both an art and a science. Many of the signals we collect are encrypted, and usually they're not in English. It takes a team of mathematicians, linguists, analysts, and computer scientists armed with the latest technology working around the clock to turn signals like these into usable intelligence but the results are worth it. SIGINT saves lives on the battlefield. It stops terrorist attacks and disrupts their operations. It promotes U.S. interests and alliances around the globe. It counters the proliferation of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons and it helps to thwart the flow of illegal narcotics into our country. Unfortunately, our adversaries also understand the power of signals intelligence. As we target their signals, they try to exploit ours. Hostile foreign nations try to gather information about official U.S. plans, policies, and capabilities by exploiting our communications, information systems, and networks around the clock. Each day there are millions of unauthorized probes of U.S. Defense Department computer networks alone putting our nation at risk. That's why America also counts on NSA to protect sensitive U.S. government communications and information systems from our adversaries. Our cybersecurity teams work with U.S. government agencies and our allies to provide them the tools and the knowledge they need to keep their systems secure so that our adversaries are unable to gain access to sensitive U.S. and allied information. The systems we design allow our leaders to communicate and exchange information securely in real time anywhere in the world. And from outer space to cyberspace, information is power. 
When we know our adversary's information, and they don't know ours, we have the information advantage. And that information advantage is what the National Security Agency, Central Security Service, gives the American people. I hope you enjoyed that clip. Again, my name is Mark Aislinn. I'm the Deputy Commandant and Provost of the National Cryptologic School at NSA. And I'd like to talk to you this morning a little bit about NSA and about cybersecurity specifically as a career option. I've worked for NSA over the past 20 years, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about my career, although I'll tell you that every individual here at NSA has had a very different career trajectory. There are so many different opportunities for one's career. In my case, I came out of uh, academe. So some of our personnel come right out of college, their undergraduate years, or they start as a military member, one of, a member of the armed services here. A few come right out of high school through one of our specialized training programs. And some have had careers before coming to the agency, and that was me. I was a professor for some years. I was a Chinese language and literature professor at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, and then at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Go Gophers. Over the past 20 years, I've had a variety of jobs. That's one of the benefits of working for a large agency. I started as a Chinese language analyst, translating, analyzing, and reporting on intelligence for policymakers and other customers. I spent 10 years tracking foreign intelligence officers and hunting for spies as a counterintelligence and counterespionage officer. I then led an organization responsible for countering foreign commercial threats. Later, I headed the China and East Asia Cyber Analysis Office and then served as Deputy Chief of the Cyber and Counterintelligence Office, which looks at threats worldwide. Along the way, I served in two posts outside of NSA. After 9-11, there was a great interest in the U.S. government in ensuring that intelligence agencies were working closely together. And so they have encouraged us to spend time in other agencies to learn those agencies' cultures and missions. And so for me, I served for a period of time in CIA operations. And then most recently, I served as the cyber advisor to the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. The Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, is kind of like CIA for the Defense Department. I've also had the pleasure of working very closely with our closest allies, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and count many friends among them. And as I said, currently, I am the Deputy Commandant and Provost of the National Cryptologic School, which is NSA's training, training arm. You heard a bit about NSA in the video, but let's go over some of the basics. NSA is part of the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. The crux of what NSA does for our country is to try to gain the information advantage to keep our nation safe. We protect the information on national security systems, and we try to glean information from our foreign adversaries. That's the information advantage. So what are NSA's two main missions that work toward that advantage? If you think of it like a football game, we have both an offense and a defense. Our offensive game is signals intelligence, or SIGINT. There are many ints in the intelligence business. Intelligence produced from human sources is called HUINT. Intelligence produced from geographic and geospatial sources is called GEOINT. Intelligence from measurement and signatures like radar is called MAZINT. And intelligence collected from washers and dryers is called LINT. Sorry, that's an old intel dad joke. We produce foreign intelligence on foreign adversaries in response to demands from U.S. government policy and deci decision makers. Combatant commands, those are the organizations of our armed services to focus on particular areas of defense, like the Pacific region or the Americas or Europe or Africa and also our network defenders. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more a little bit later. 
Such intelligence is derived from signals that come from phone conversations, text messages, emails, and all other kinds of electronic communications of our foreign adversaries. It's important to note that we do this in strict compliance of the laws, regulations, and policies that govern those operations. This means that we're interested in foreign adversary intelligence, and we're committed to protecting the rights and privacy of U.S. persons. By collecting this intelligence, we discover threats and gain unique insights on our adversaries. This helps us to generate a comprehensive threat picture for our leaders and allies. NSA's defensive game is cybersecurity, protecting the information that lives on our national security systems, which handle the most sensitive data of the federal government and military. We leverage our cybersecurity authorities to examine national security systems, provide solutions to secure and defend our national security systems, support operational defense of critical networks through mitigation advice, incident response, and information sharing with customers and partners. NSA was established in 1952, and the National Cryptologic School, where I'm now the Deputy Commandant, was later established in 1965 to educate and train the NSA workforce. As put forth by NSA's first director, Lieutenant General Ralph Canine, there are some jobs that are so specialized, so unique, or require such unusual combination of knowledge and skills that the labor market cannot supply such people with all the necessary training. NSA has many such jobs, and through necessity, NSA has developed an elaborate system of training to supplement the employee's basic skills. So basically, what we have is a need to supplement the knowledge that our new employees learned in college or in the military with job-specific knowledge and skills. And so the National Cryptologic, uh, Cryptologic School, also known as NCS, was NSA's solution to ensuring our workforce has the necessary skills and knowledge to accomplish our two main missions. Over the years, NCS has expanded its offerings to include not just cryptologic education and training, but all of the skills and knowledge needed to do business at NSA. And so today, NCS has four colleges, the College of Language and Area Studies, the College of Cryptology, the College of Cyber, and the College of Leadership and Business. We offer over 1,300 classes in such wide-ranging fields as mathematics, system security, writing, counterintelligence, computer science, diversity and inclusion, and so much more, including courses in many languages. It's important to us that we have a well-rounded workforce that not only has the education and training to do their jobs, but also to be responsible citizens and employees of the federal government and know how to be successful in their careers. People who work toward a successful career will ultimately do a better job at protecting our national security. So what do you think? Are we ever done with education? I'm a little older than most of you, and I can tell you from experience that if I'd stopped learning, stopped getting the education and obtaining new skills, my life, my career would have been pretty boring, not to mention that I'd become pretty irrelevant after just a few years. Think about it. If you had gone to college, gone to medical school, done your residency, got all that you needed for your proper and education and training to be a surgeon, once you get your job, are you done? What happens when new medical discoveries are made? What happens when the technology improves and safer and less invasive techniques become available? Do patients want the surgeon who uses only the education and training he or she received 20 years ago? Or the surgeon who has continued to learn and grow and improve? Every industry evolves with time. And every industry has people whose education, training, experience, personal background, and continued learning affects how well it adapts. So, so for those of you who think it'll be finally over when I graduate high school or college or grad school, just remember that learning never stops. As I mentioned earlier, NSA values continued learning, which is why the NCS exists not just because of the specialized work we do, but because we have to remain relevant. 
for an agency such as ours, ensuring that our workforce has the skills and knowledge necessary affects people's lives and livelihoods. We support troops who are on the ground in harm's way. Having sufficient knowledge and training could mean the difference between life or death for our troops. We're protecting our people. I know that for me, some of the most satisfying parts of my career has been when my team has been involved in saving people's lives. I know specific situations where people are alive today because of the work that we did. We also protect our national security systems, as I mentioned before. If someone doesn't know how to do their job, it could mean the compromise of classified information that puts our whole country at risk. We also operate using taxpayer dollars, and therefore, it's important that we have a workforce that is prepared to do the job and avoid catastrophe that could cost lives and also ending up costing the taxpayers much, much more. One of those areas that we require that require constant upskilling is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is critical to every facet of our way of life here, and therefore we, as a country, as a society, have to have the cadre of skilled cybersecurity professionals to secure our nation and protect our economy. Before I get into talking about cybersecurity as a career path, I'd like to turn this over to my colleague, Mr. Matt Sprouse, who will give you a brief demo of the importance of cybersecurity. Thank you, Dr. Aislin. My name is Matt Sprouse, and I am currently in the College of Cyber in the National Cryptologic School. I was, before that, I was one of those cyber analysts that Dr. Aislin was talking about securing our nation's computers, securing our networks, and making sure that the adversaries cannot get that cyber intelligence from our systems. One of The thing I wanted to show you today is a demonstration of just how ingrained computers are into our way of life. And to do that, allow me to show you my demonstration setup here. And you're probably going to recognize what this is set up to be a simulation of. It's set up to be a simulation of a traffic light. And we're all familiar with what traffic lights do and how traffic lights work, okay? So as this cycles through, just realize that in every corner, in every major metropolitan area, there's one or two or three of these, okay? In my setup, I have, of course, my traffic control light, which is just a st light stack that allows us to show what this looks like. But here are the brains of it. Let me flip this up so you can see a little better. Okay. The black box here with all the wires is simply a cross-connect con cross panel. It allows the computer, which is this little tiny gray box here, to communicate with the light and the light stack. This little gray box is what's commonly referred to as a microcontroller. It's part of a large kind of system called industrial control systems, or ICS. And these controllers are out there controlling all of the things that make our modern way of life work. Things like traffic lights, things like water, controlling the water flow in metropolitan areas, waste and sewage water, electricity generation, electricity distribution, so that when you go and flip the light switch on in your house, the lights come on because the electricity is there. That's because all of these controllers are doing their job and doing what they were programmed to do. Here's the thing to keep in mind. All of these millions of computers that are out there and running on a daily basis, they are computers. By their very definition, a computer is a piece of hardware that is designed to be programmed. A human being sits down and writes a control program that controls the input that they gather, the processing that they do with that input, and controls the output, just like this traffic light. So when a car comes up to my traffic light and it's sensed, a sensor triggers, which causes the microcontroller's program to recognize 
something is there, and now we need to switch so that the traffic can move in that direction. Then that traffic will pass. There's no more traffic. The light goes back to normal, and it allows the traffic to flow in the other direction. Okay? Think about what I just said. A computer is a piece of hardware that's designed to be programmed. That means the good guys, if you will, can program it to do good things. We can make sure that the traffic light works the way we expect it to. We can make sure the water is provided where it's needed to be. We can make sure that all of the things of life work perfectly. Okay. But also realize that we have the adversaries out there, the bad guys, if you will. And bad guys can also put their programs into these computers. If the bad guys are able to put bad programs into the computer, then the bad guys can control what the light does at the traffic light. It can cause really strange things to occur. Okay, Imagine every stoplight in, I don't know, Washington, D.C., suddenly doing this. That might cause a little bit of confusion and a little bit of chaos. Okay? So again, things to remember about this is that we have all of these controllers out there. These are set up and they run on very limited hardware. These controllers are designed to be put into non-air conditioned spaces. They're designed to be put into factory floors where the temperature can go up to 150 degrees. They're designed to be outside where the temperature can go down in some parts of our country can go down below zero without any ventilation, without any cooling, without any heating. So these computers have to be designed to be very rugged. What that generally means is they cannot be as powerful as others. Just for example, this microcontroller that I'm currently using here, Micrologix 1400, is designed, it has a whopping 64K of memory. To put that in perspective, the oldest cell phone you have ever seen has more memory than this microcontroller that's controlling this traffic light. And that's generally true for most of the industrial control systems that are around. So we have to be very careful, okay? Security is a never ending job, just like Dr. Aislinn was talking about. You know, education never ends. Well, security never ends either. You have to be very conscious of who has your information, where the information is, who can connect to this information, okay? This controller, is set up to be a standalone device. It does not connect to anything except for the computer that I use to program. The benefit of that is I can now control who has access to this and I can control how and who programs it. Here's the problem. The traffic control light that's sitting at the corner that you're thinking about right now near your school or near your home that controller is connected to the larger network. It's connected to a network, and most likely it's connected to the internet. What else is connected to the internet? Every other computer on the planet, okay? whether you're in China, you're in Russia, you're in Timbuktu, you're somewhere in South Africa, all of these are connected, and that means an adversary, given the right skill, given the right tools, given the right abilities, can reach out across the internet and connect to that stoplight. So they can cause strangeness to happen. So how do we fix this? Well, we have to be aware. We have to be careful. We have to build controls and we have to build safeguards in so that this controller will only listen to the people we want it to listen to and ignore anybody else. Computers are dumb. 
we always think, we like to think computers are smart. No, computers are really, really, really fast. And they're really, really, really precise when they're calculating, when they're doing math. But they're really dumb in that they will do exactly what they're told to do. And they will do it no matter who the person is that told them to do it. Computers will immediately follow any instruction that they are that's received in the proper format. So what does that mean? In our current world, we're starting to get computerized everything. Okay. My garage door opener in my house, I got a new one installed. They graciously provided a feature such that it can be connected to the internet. I can have an app on my cell phone and I can not only open and can open and close the garage door with the app on my cell phone, but I can also turn on the little camera that's in the device and look around in my garage. Now, is that convenient for me as the appropriate owner? Absolutely. Okay. Can I, oops, I think I forgot to shut my garage door, turn on the camera. Sure enough, I did. Click the button, close my door. But again, so can everybody else on the internet. Yes, there is security involved. Security, countermeasures, controls, range, span the gamut. They can be really, really, really simple or not existent all the way up through very secure and very safe. Okay? As part of the National Cryptology School and as part of the National Security Agency, when I was a cybersecurity analyst, we looked at some of the very, very, very secure controls. And there are some out there. Just be aware that most of the companies that are doing things for profit, their bottom line is profit. So they're going to do what's cost effect and secure. So it's going to be cost effective and secure. There's got to be that balance. I know. I know. There are some of you out there that are thinking, man, this Matt Sprouse guy is paranoid. Remember, the textbook definition of paranoia is the irrational fear that everyone is out to get you. If you spend any time on the Internet, you know that there are people out there trying to, quote unquote, get you. So it's not paranoia. It is a healthy respect for what's going on in the real world. Okay. So again, I did this demonstration just to show you that, you know, traffic lights are just computerized devices nowadays. There's very few analog devices that exist anymore. Most of these things are controlled by computers. Computers are easily programmed and reprogrammed, and they will do exactly what they're told to do when they're told to do it by whoever is allowed to get access to their program. Okay. So realize our way of life is built around computers. Our way of life is increasingly becoming interdependent with these things. This is one of the reasons why the National Security Agency and the National Cryptologic School's mission will never end because there's always the next threat the next bad guy, the next problem that needs to be solved. And we need the best and brightest to help fix these problems. And we're always on the lookout. Okay. So with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Aislinn, who will go over NSA and some of the ways that you can get involved in this cybersecurity happiness and some of the ways that you can be involved if you're interested to. So Dr. Aislinn? Thank you, Matt. Mr. Sprouse is one of our, a fine example of one of our many of our many great faculty at NCS, and so I really appreciate his taking time to speak to us today. All right, we're going to continue. Cybersecurity touches practically every industry, as Mr. Sprouse had pointed out. We, as a country, need cybersecurity in finance, healthcare, manufacturing, transportation emergency services, energy, government, education, the list goes on and on. There is currently a tremendous shortage of cyber professionals to protect those sectors. Cyberseek.org is a, pro a project of the National In Initiative on Cyber for Cybersecurity Education, or NICE. 
that provides detailed, actionable data about supply and demand in the cybersecurity job market. CyberSeek did a recent study and continues to keep tabs on cyber job openings. They say that the number of online job openings job listings for cybersecurity-related positions from October of 2019 through September of last year was 520,617, basically more than half a million job openings, while the total number of people currently employed in the cybersecurity workforce during that time was 941,904. That means that we need to increase our cyber workforce by more than half of what currently exists. So there are lots of opportunities for you. CyberSeek is talking about cyber-related jobs in the United States across all sectors and not just the government. And what kinds of jobs are we talking about? The top job titles requested by employers within the cybersecurity job market included engineers, analysts, consultants, managers, systems engineers, software developers, network engineers, vulnerability analysts, technicians, teachers. So if you're thinking about a job in cyber, not only are there countless sectors in which you can work and a plethora of jobs, but there are many disciplines or kinds of jobs within cybersecurity. Now, I'm not here to be a recruiter for NSA, although we too are looking for talented cyber professionals. NSA just understands that it takes a partnership between government, academia, and private industry to keep our country's network safe. A cyber attack against a bank or a hospital is an attack on things that are vital to the people of our nation. A hacker's tactic against a school or a research facility could again be used against a national security system or critical infrastructure. That's why government and industry must work together to protect our country's computer networks. We're all on the same team. Cyber-related professionals are in high demand at NSA and across the government in cyber defense, cyber security, cyber threat analysis, and many, many other areas. To that end, the National Cryptologic School manages a few cyber educational programs that extend beyond our walls and our NSA workforce. One is a program called Gen Cyber, which brings cybersecurity camps to kids from kindergarten through high school. These camps are offered during the summertime all over the country. Some are virtual. These days, most are virtual. Some are in person, and we'll see more in person in the future. Some are hybrid, and some are even residential, and they occur, as I said, all over the country. They provide you with some of the foundational cyber-related cyber related education and hands-on activities that you may find interesting. I'm going to show you a brief video from Gen Cyber's program. So I had read an article about the need for cybersecurity professionals and how government agencies were putting on these camps. And what I liked about it was, of course, I didn't have to pay anything to come here. There's a critical shortage of cybersecurity professionals in the United States, not just within government, but also within industry and academia. So the National Security Agency created the Gen Cyber Program to raise awareness in middle and high school students about the opportunities that are available to them in the cybersecurity field. In addition to the program here at Marymount University in Washington, D.C., NSA is sponsoring more than 130 Gen Cyber camps at universities and academic institutions across the U.S., each offering a unique curriculum. Our goal is to have programs in all 50 states. Gen Cyber Camp is a opportunity for high school and middle school students uh, to improve their knowledge of cyber security as a digital citizen and also to consider a career in cyber security.
we did an activity or a lab where we um, we look for each other or we search about stuff based on our family or just us on the internet. I was shocked to see that a lot of pictures of my family were on Google Images. It was really weird. Well, I never really thought that like a phone would be something I had to protect. And um, our teacher talked about that a lot and how easy it was to um, get into it. And I am one of those people that has a four- um, Four digit passcode. Yeah, which is, <laughs> I will change immediately. We were going through the slideshow of the different types of attacks that hackers will try to go through to get your information. And it's good to, to know where they're coming from so that you'll know where to look. It's been really beneficial coming here and seeing and, and talking to the people and hearing people who actually like have worked in the field. We've had some guest speakers here um, from different companies and uh, they've given us a lot of insight about, you know, um, the recruiting process and what exactly that they do at uh, the different companies. What I've learned at Camp This Week is really going to help me with my career because of the fact that it's really kind of providing a good foundation for what I'm going to do as a career. I think what I learned about cybersecurity is that it's not just one occupation. There are so many different things in cybersecurity that maybe one pathway will really speak to you when something else didn't. This is a great opportunity to see exactly what this entire field is about. I guess just see what it's like before making a definite career choice. The Gen Cyber Camps are open to middle and high school students and teachers regardless of your experience level. It's a great resume builder and best of all, the camps are free. This is a field that's rapidly expanding right now. It's huge and it's in the news probably daily. And so just having the opportunity to come down, especially to DC, and meet people who are in the thick of it and to build those connections, it's an incredible opportunity. So I hope you enjoyed that. And you can see at the bottom of the slide here, if you want to know more about the Gen Cyber Camps, go to gen-cyber.info and you'll get more information. Also, gen-cyber.com will also get you there. Another program that we manage at NCS is the National Centers for Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity, also known as NCAE. This program sets standards of excellence for the cybersecurity degree programs at colleges and universities. So these institutions submit themselves to a review of their degree programs, the rigor of their curricula, the quality of their cyber education faculty, and their outreach efforts. If an institution meets those standards, they are designated as National Centers of Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity. If you're looking to get a degree in cybersecurity or in computer science, you can get more information about the National Centers of Academic Excellence at caecommunity.org. Going to an NCAE designated institution will ensure that you'll receive a good education that will certainly prepare you to enter the job market with the foundation you need to be successful. Yet another outreach program that we manage at NCS, which isn't only cybersecurity related, is StarTalk. StarTalk is similar to Gen Cyber, but it's foreign language related camps. StarTalk camps are available for students from kindergarten through college, and its goals include increasing the number of students enrolled in and instructors who teach critical languages. We have a great need in the United States to have our young students get interested in languages for cybersecurity and many other areas. And so we have this partnership to increase this interest and creating a foundation for the learning of these critical languages. And right now, these critical languages are Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Persian, and Russian. If learning languages is your thing and you're interested in StarTalk, go to startalk.umd.edu. So today we talked a little bit about NSA and NCS, what we do, and some of the things that we offer. I also discussed the job gap within the cybersecurity field and hopefully gave you something to think about as you explore what you want your future career to be. 
We also talked about the importance of lifelong learning and how continuing to learn and grow will benefit you throughout your life. Before we wrap up, I just want to point out career opportunities that we have for high school students. So we have a high school work study program that allows participants to work part-time during their senior year of high school in business, computers, engineering, manufacturing, construction, graphic arts, and Chinese and Russian languages. We also have the gifted and talented program for high school seniors who are taking advanced level language, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics courses. Finally, we have the Stokes program. This is open to high school seniors, particularly minority students who are planning to major in computer science or computer and electrical engineering. There are also opportunities for college students, and we particularly encourage college students to check out uh, the Stokes program, as well as in uh, a later summer of their college career, especially looking at uh, ju- the, the summer of their, after their junior year, applying sometime during sophomore year, uh, to come to NSA and work during the summer. It's a great opportunity to come to know the work in NSA, what it's like at NSA. You are cleared to do the work of an NSA analyst or whatever particular position, mathematician that you're hired to. And it's kind of a foot in the door. So these are things that you can check out by going to nsa.gov and click Join our team, student programs. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take those questions now. In the meantime, Mark, how often are the Gen Cyber Camps held? Are they only held in the summer? Do they hold them during the school year? Currently, they're being held during the summer, but we're looking at expanding them so that we have them occurring throughout the year. Right now, they're being held that they should be beginning soon for 2021 in the summertime, again, across the United States. And as I mentioned before, because of COVID, these camps are, uh, I think, all virtual this year. But uh, as I said, as uh, conditions improve, we'll be able to look at that. And as as I also uh, noted, we are hoping to expand this to a full year program. Terrific. Do you know about the national CAEs in cyber operations and cyber defense? Right. So these are, as I mentioned, we have the national CAEs. They have uh, specific focuses. So some are a cyber operations focused CAE. Some have a cyber defense focus. I would uh, encourage folks to go and check out the website and you'll get a breakdown of which schools uh, have what programs. Terrific. Okay. All right. Thanks so much again, students, for joining us. Thank you to Mark and Matt. And Thank you. Thank you for your time, all of you, and good luck.